Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. Today, we're talking about school safety with my man, Daniel Deluzneski. He is a retired Secret Service lieutenant, a retired Florida school system school safety supervisor. He has personally overseen 100,000 students, 140 schools, and hundreds of lockdown drills. He's now a consultant, and he speaks directly to parents about school safety. This may be uncomfortable for you. I encourage you to stick with it. Gone are the days where we don't have to think about this anymore. And so today we've got a true expert coming to us and talking to us about school safety. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the show. Jay, I appreciate it. Uh, Important subject. And uh, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited. So you've gone from, uh, we were talking a little bit off air and you started with a path, which was talking to school systems. And now you're on a new path. Can you walk us through how this, how this kind of evolved for you? Yeah, once, uh, it, and I, I'm going to be going back a, a little bit, but uh, once I got into this uh, school safety issue after I retired from the Secret Service, uh, you find out it's pretty much a bureaucracy, just like any other government agency. I didn't have autonomy. Uh, I had to go through a superintendent for, to ask for things that were going on at schools. But I was in a very good county where we had enough money. And that's one of the biggest issues, obviously, with school safety is having, having enough money and picking the right things to use that money for uh, to create uh, uh, safe zones uh, from the outside in, safe lobby areas, locked classrooms, the doors, the whole nine, th- and the whole nine yards uh, uh, with the system. Anyway, when I started this, uh, going on a podcast and, and consulting, I did start with teachers and principals and asking them about what drills they were using and making suggestions on, well, can we try this type of drill or is it possible we can do this for school emergencies? And I got pushback saying, you know, your, your ideas are okay. However, we're getting, you know, information and we're getting told we have to do drills this way. And they said that there's nothing we could do. It's coming down from legislation, school board members, whatever. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you for listening. So I, I decided to switch over to parents. And as you know, since COVID and the pandemic, parents have got a lot more control. We've seen what happens a lot of these school board meetings and what's happening in school. I think that's what parents found out during the pandemic going, oh my God, you're teaching my kid this. And that raised a lot of hackles and red flags going, whoa, this is wrong. So I I make my message to parents because parents do have control, but they do have to talk to their children. And I know your show is about fathers. I'm a father. I have a 17 year old. I've, you know, obviously been with him since he was small. We, we were up in Maryland when I was worked there and came down here to Florida and and went through the system here. And it, as you know, once they get to teenage years, they're very tough to talk to because it's all about, you know, phones and that addiction of video games, especially for boys. But I want fathers and, and, and parents, especially uh, moms and dads to talk to their kids. I understand you're only going to get a few minutes of conversation. If that, it's going to be yes or no answers. However, ask them when you have a school emergency at your school, what do you do? Let's say, you know, I I really don't want to focus so much on active shooters. I know the media concentrates on that, but which is probably, yes, the most important part. However, we need to find out what are they doing? Okay. Ask your kid, what do you do? And see if they answer. Oh, we, uh, we run out of the school and we go to where we have the fire uh, when we have a fire escape or no, we stay in the classroom and we wait until someone comes and unlocks the door or yeah, they're teaching us that we should throw things at the gunman when they get there or, you know, some other options kind of thing. Well, the teacher makes a decision that, okay, should we run? Should we stay here? Okay. Find out what they're doing. And if any of that, and you go, wait a minute, they're teaching you to do what? What what do you mean you're throwing things at a person with a gun? So find out what what they're they're doing. Most of the time, and I back up a little bit, when this all first started, uh, you know, everybody talks about Columbine. Look, we had school shootings way before Columbine. That's just the media just picked up on that because it was so intense and the numbers and all this stuff. We've had shootings before that. Anyway, when that started, they decided, okay. What we're going to do is called a lockdown. And a lockdown is pretty simple. You lock the classroom door, you close the blinds, you turn the lights off, the kids sit on the floor away from the door and away from the windows, 
silence your phone. You don't listen to any announcements. You don't open that door until it's all over. Okay. Someone will come and unlock the door for you. And that's been the procedure. That's been the gold standard for all these years, that however many years, something I still believe in. And the reason I believe in that is because no shooter, and I use the word shooter, has breached a locked door ever. It takes too long. They're not going to do it. it. It just takes too long. Now, during all this time, you get people, obviously in education, that said, ah, you know, we got to try something different. You know, lockdowns, uh, we, we, there has to be something different out there. Everybody wants to do something different. There's all emotion behind this, the knee-jerk reaction. Okay, so just a few years, I want to say a few years ago, it might have been five or six years ago, there was something called Run, Hide, Fight. And Run, Hide, Fight came out with Department of Homeland Security. The Houston Police Department did a video. It's like 20 years old. It's a good video. It's made for corporations adults. It's made for businesses. You watch it. Okay. You come in, you see this bad guy. He's all dressed in black. You got the narration there from the guy who does the movie narration. And they're saying, oh, if you can run, if you can, I'm sorry, if you can run, run, run out of the building, you know, find a safe place, call 911, whatever. If you can't do that, hide under a desk, in an office, in the bathroom, wherever you hide somewhere out of sight. Last resort, if it comes to it, you need to fight, meaning grab a fire extinguisher, your chair, whatever. Okay. For adults. All right. For some reason, Jay, within the past few years, they said, you know what? Why don't we transfer this over to schools? So now you're thinking, and I concentrate on elementary schools. I'm sorry, because most of your school systems have the majority of elementary schools. Then it gets smaller with middle schools and even smaller to high schools. So now you're going to have little kids from what? age, you know, six, seven, all the way up. And you're going to have them run out of a perfectly safe classroom into a hallway because they got to go to the hallway before they get to the exit. Run to the exit outside into a safe place. Okay. For some reason, someone thought that would make sense. Here's the bad thing about that. Number one, who's deciding that you run? Is it the teacher? Mm -hmm. You're not getting an announcement over the loudspeaker saying, hey, you know, there's a gunman on campus. Everybody run. They don't know where the gunman is. Does the teacher know where the gunman is? If I'm a teacher, I put myself in place of a teacher. If I'm a teacher and I hear gunfire and they say, hey, what, we have to go into a lockdown. Okay. And they give the teacher that option to run. Why would I make that? Why would the liability be on me as a teacher to decide with 25 to 30 kids? Hey, kids, come on. We're going to run out of here and get to that exit. I don't know where the gunman is, but that's where we're going to go. Where did common sense go in all this? All right. Second part, hide. Yeah, perfect. All right, you're going to hide. The third part is run. I, I'm sorry. The third part is fight. I get confused. I'm going to have little children fight some person with a gun? No, it's, it's not coming to that. So what some systems have done, they said, oh, well, okay, for elementary kids, we're not going to have them fight, but we're going to do the run and hide part. Well, wait a minute. Why, why not just leave it in a lockdown? What do you, why, why are you running? Where are you running to? And you know what, Jay? It's not just one classroom that's going to run if they all decide to do that. It's every classroom. So what's going to happen? You're going to have these kids pile up at that exit door because during the drill of the run, hide, fight drill, they're not running. They're walking. Here we go, kids. Just like a fire drill. Here we go. We're going to go down here and go out to say, okay, everything's fine. Kumbaya. We're going to sit over here. Everything's fine. You're going to tell children during the most emotionally horrifying event to run now out of this classroom into a hallway where they're going to see bad stuff. They're going to hear bad stuff and try to get them to that exit safely and outside without piling up. Now, do you think all those children in that classroom are going to go? You are going to have kids freeze. You are going to have kids crying, saying, I'm not going. I No, I'm not going anywhere. You're going to have little kids saying, my dad's a police officer. He said, we stay in a lockdown. I'm not going anywhere. So all the pressure is on the teacher to make this decision. 
I advocate stay in a lockdown. This run, hide, fight. No, it's the worst thing ever for a school. So then they said, okay, there's another marketing uh, thing out there. It's called ALICE. And ALICE training is an acronym, and it stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. And this marketing company has been out for another probably 10 years. And I tell you what, Jay, school, schools, they love it. They love it. And you know why they love it? Because it gives them power. It gives them control and they get to react. When you think about it in a lockdown, we're sitting in a classroom. You're passive. You're passive. You're just waiting for things to end. You're just, sure. we're waiting for things to be over. In Alice training, you're reactive. You're doing something. All right. First part is an alert. Perfect. I need to hear over the communication system. There's someone on campus that's going to hurt me. L is lockdown. You're great. You're already in a lockdown. I is informed. The way Alice trains this is that someone in the administration is supposed to be looking at cameras and following the gunman and announcing it over the PA system saying, okay, the gunman's on floor two at room one oh whatever, and they're heading north. There's, I, there's no school in existence that has that. I don't know anybody that has anything like that. I wish I had that. You don't have that. You don't have a camera that can follow one person through a school. You got cameras that, you know, in general, look down a hallway, look this way, look, you don't follow something that follows people. All right. Forget about that. The C part is counter. They got away from the fight part and said, okay, no, no, we're not going to call it fight. We're going to call it counter. We're going to counter the individual. How are they going to counter the individual? They teach kids to throw things at the gunman. To to throw things. Okay. Here, here is, it, it just, it, it gets me very angry. You've got a child. I don't care what age he is. All the way up to high school. A child who's never been involved in anything like this. Let's just say, for example, you take that child who's never played basketball ever. And you hand that, that child a basketball and say, okay, I'm going to give you an hour and a half to shoot at that basket to be perfect. An hour and a half. Then you're going to take the ball away. And you're going to wait six months. And six months go by. Come on, we're going to try this again. And hand that person the basketball. Okay, now you got to shoot exactly into that basket. That's how they're training these kids. They give them an hour and a half of training. Take whatever, phone, pencil, iPad, I don't know. And all these kids in the classroom, including the teacher, to precisely throw something at the gunman. To what? Distract them? What? Again, this emotional, just terrifying event, and you're going to train them to throw something precisely at a gunman. If any parent hears anything like that, you better be really angry about that being taught to your child for something like that. Because what's that gunman going to do? He is going to get really pissed, and he is just going to start killing even more. Okay, the E part's evacuate, which basically becomes the run thing again, the E part of Alice. Anyway, back to this counter thing. You got, you got to think about it. Let, let's think in common sense. There are no child psychologists, no child development people, no child mental health people that back this kind of training for children, okay? And what about liability? Who's training these, these people? What, what kind of background, what kind of certification do they have? And what about insurance? You're going to have kids doing this in a drill? Look, so far, and I get this from a company called Safe Havens International, safehavensinternational.org. They have done the research. So far, Jay, $130 million in lawsuits have come against schools just in the training and drilling of this type of stuff. Not even the real thing, just in the drilling that amount of money. So think about it. It just, I advocate lockdowns. They are still backed by uh, special resource officers. They're backed by child psychologists. They, they work. Okay. Everyone thinks, and, and, I, and I want parents out there to think, look, okay, how about playing devil's advocate? Because what we get and I'm former law enforcement. I got plenty of law enforcement people out there say, oh, 
Oh, we don't want them doing that. They're sitting ducks. They're sitting ducks sitting there in that classroom. No, they're not. No one has breached that locked door. And they're not about to do that. I'll give an example. Years ago, up in Minnesota, there was a Native American reservation. And an individual up there got mad at his grandfather and his grandfather's girlfriend. So he decided to kill him, killed him and the girlfriend. Ran to the school, shot a security guard, then started going down the hallway and started shooting whoever he could shot at. Gets to that clock door. It took him three shots at that door, and he still didn't get in. Finally, he went around and broke a window and got in that way. So it was a perfect example. And I don't know what kind of locks they had on the door back then, but now nowadays doors are even more secure. Right. No, they're not going to breach a locked door. They're, they're not going to do it because it takes too long. You see, I always give the example of the Nashville shooter because it was a really good video. You see the individual busted through the glass doors. And they're going down the hallway and they're checking the doors. It's locked. They move on. Locked, move on. Open, boom, they're in. They're looking for easy access, easy victims, because they also have a clock in their head. And they know the police are coming. Okay. So I want Got parents it. to talk to their children. What's going on in your schools with these emergency drills? If you hear something that, oh, we run out of the classroom. If you hear something that they're throwing things at a gunman. That should raise the red flags. You should say, whoa, I got to talk to somebody. Now, you have avenues. All right, my man. You can okay. talk. So, so, my man, how do you as a feel-good father, because I, I think this has been, it's boggling my mind. All this information is crazy. Uh, what what does that conversation look like? Let's, let's give feel-good fathers uh, some sort of script, some sort of talking points of how do they speak to their children uh, about this particular situation? Well, I, everybody's different. My son, uh, when he comes home from school, um, uh, it's usually my best time to talk to him because obviously as soon as he gets home from school, boom, upstairs, he's on whatever video games, whatever they got to do. Okay. I, I say catch them, but yes, catch them at a moment. I understand nowadays it, it's hard. There's no family dinners anymore. You don't all sit around the table at dinner anymore. If that does, that'd be a perfect opportunity also to talk about it. Most of the time, everybody's busy because dad's moms are working late. The kid's going to school. He's going to athletics, after school activities, whatever. Catch them at the moment, whether it's sitting in the car, driving them to school, driving them home. Catch them at the moment where you could just ask the question. It doesn't have to be a long conversation. Just say, hey, I got to ask you something. How are you doing your emergency drills at school? And they could they could ask me specific. They could say, well, for fire drills, we do this. Uh, for a weapon on campus, we do this. For active shooter, we do that. Um, if they don't get to where you want to go, meaning you want to lead to this active shooter drill, because that's the one that schools now are supposed to be uh, taking charge of, the, the one that leads all this. So if it comes to that, say, you know, if there's a gunman on campus, what what do you guys do? What What do you do? And if they're, if they're like, well, you know, if they're kind of hesitating, yeah, we sit on the floor, get specifics. Do you lock the classroom? Do you stay in the classroom? Yes. Fine. You stay in the classroom until it's over. Then someone comes and unlocks the door, right? Because you don't want to hear an announcement go, hey, lockdown's over. We're good. No, you don't want to hear that. They should come and unlock the door with a key. If they say, oh, um, no, uh, the, we wait for the teacher and the teacher says, uh, we're going to run out of the classroom. Now, where are you running to? Well, we're running to where we go for uh, a fire. Okay. All right. And then what? And then they make an announcement and then we come back in. All right. Or they may say, oh, we're being taught uh, to, to grab something and throw at, at a gunman when he comes into the classroom. Okay. so. You don't have to get, get into an argument or anything like that. Just be curious. What is it you're doing? Okay. Are, oh, you're throwing things, Adam. Well, wh what do you mean you're throwing things? Yeah, we're all supposed to throw something at the gun. Or, oh, yeah, we're all supposed to run, you know, down the hallway. Well, how far away is the exit? How long is that going to take? Uh, or what they'll do is what a lot of schools do now is called options-based training, which basically, again, puts the onus on the teacher to make that option of staying in lockdown or running out of the school. And some may say that. I talked to my son. He says, yeah, this month uh, we, well, they don't run. He says, yeah, we walked out of the classroom. 
And next month, uh, we're going to stay in the lockdown. Okay. So it, it's something that get a good moment to talk about it. And I, when I say moment, don't wait until something happens. And then it's at the top of your head going, oh my God, they just had a shooting over here. I got to talk to my kid. No, wait for that moment when they have the time to give you five minutes. That's all you need to find out what's going on and, and no arguments. Just curious. You're getting information. Get that information. If something in your head goes, whoa, that, that doesn't sound right. Now you can start contacting the school. Talk to school administrators first. If that doesn't work, go to the school board. The school board meetings are usually twice a month. They'll have them during the day, but they'll have them at night. You can get a good page and a half because it's only three minutes that you're allowed to talk. Again, if you still are not getting anywhere, now it's time to go to your state legislatures and go, this is wrong. Uh, the other thing is, Jay, a lot of times the schools- Hold on, Daniel. That was a really, I think we got to go over that again. So it was talk to the school, talk to your teachers, talk to the school board. Yeah. Uh, at the school board. And, and then, then from- And then speak to- Your state legislatures, your representatives. Yeah. And I wanted to yeah. say that, um, now I, I'm sorry, now I got off track. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, ugh, after the legislatures, what do I want to talk about? Oh, what, what parents can do uh, when they're talking to their kids. If you need that research, uh, easily, you can email me, but go to that safehavensinternational.org. Uh, they do the research. It's something you can back up going, wait a minute, you know, this, this doesn't work. Oh, that's what I'm, I want to talk about. The schools are supposed to tell you when they're having a drill. If they're having an emergency drill, an active shooter drill, they're supposed to notify you in advance. Now, I don't advocate pulling your child out. However, if they're doing something that is the, just throwing things at the government, it's like, I don't want my child learning that. I don't want them involved in anything like that. So I'm, I'm not having them come in that day. Now, the other side of that is saying, well, if there is a real emergency, your child's not going to know what to do. Well, you're doing it wrong. I don't want my child involved in that at all. It just is going to make the things worse. Uh, so it, it's really up to you. They should tell you how they're doing these drills and when they're doing them. If you don't agree with it, put your kid out for that day, you know, uh, because the other thing that's happening, Jay, is I've got some parents that feel that the drills are, are traumatizing children. Okay. A little bit, uh, uh, a different topic here. Let's say they go into a lockdown and the child comes home and says, oh, what'd you do today? Oh, we went into a lockdown. Like, wait, what? The school didn't tell me that. Are you okay? How did it go? Blah, 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 blah. I'm angry because they didn't tell me. I don't want my child going through these drills. Okay. Um, yes, I understand today. It's, I, you know, helicopter parenting. You want control of all this stuff. You don't want your child being traumatized. You know, we, we've all been through it. Uh, I went through it back during the Cuban Missile Crisis when we had a duck and cover. Um, nowadays you talk to most of these kids and most of them are used to it. You know, they're, they're used to these type of drills. They don't have to, you know, especially little kids, uh, you know, they're going to listen to their teacher middle and high school. Yeah. It gets the, uh, the, the point sometimes where they don't take it really seriously. Uh, because again, they don't think it's ever going to happen there and it probably will not, but you just want to be prepared for it. So it's something that to me personally, I don't think it traumatizes children. There are studies out there that say it doesn't traumatize children. But again, it's up to the parents uh, if they want them to go through these type of drills. That's uh, one thing. Again, we're talking about what parents can do uh, to talk to their children. So, um, yeah, other than that, I, I want parents to be more involved. I, I want, I understand because, again, years ago, you dropped the kid off, good to go. All right, we trust the school. And that, no, nowadays you got to find out what's going on. You, you want your child safe. Got it. Let's, um, I'm, I'm loving this. This is super great. I'd love to, to really kind of focus in on what are the conversations that you have with the, the teachers, the school board and the state legislator. So I've, um, but you know, I'm in Nashville, so we did a lot of coverage of the covenant mm -hmm. shooting mm -hmm. and, um, I was following up and, and working with stuff and I, you know, and. It was kind of like, that was like this big hoopla about 
what was happening and all these different conversations with the state legislator about what was happening in our schools, in the area. But I think that one of the core things that's going on, especially for feel good fathers, especially for this world, is that we're really, we really need and are looking for how do we best communicate what it is that we want? Uh, because emotions run high. Yep. And when we have, we have talking points, when we've got topics, when we are specific, when we're cool and calm, uh, that is typically the way to change things. There's a, but however, and I want to say this because, uh, not criticizing, there is a place for protesting and there is a place for making change. And if you're like me, you've seen some of these videos of people speaking to state legislators and they're comical for a, a very serious topic. Mm-hmm. What would you suggest, given your background, that you as a parent would bring up and speak to uh, concisely to address certain situations? Well, again, first of all, if you start with the administration, you, you'd start with either the, the, the teacher, you can email them. And of course, they're going to backtrack and circle the wagon to say, hey, this is what we're told to do. You'd have to talk to principal so-and-so. All right. So you could talk to some principal so-and-so. Uh, I'm concerned about the drills that you're running. Uh, I, I, I don't think they're correct in running this way. And the principal, again, may come back and say, well, I'm getting direction from the school board. Uh, you know, I may agree with you, but I, I get my directions from above. So they kind of pass in the buck. Once you do get in front of the school board, it's not going to be an argument. They're not going to sit there arguing with you. They will help let you talk and, and speak about certain things. But again, parental power, it, and when you get a group of people, I don't care. A lot of times it's Facebook or, you know, some kind of social media where you can get a group of parents together to say, hey, they're running these drills at schools that I think are dangerous to children. I've got the research. I'm not going to have my child throwing things at a gunman. I'm not going to have my child run out of a perfectly safe classroom because they're telling me it's it's better. Uh, I don't agree with it. I want to make changes. And usually when the parents get together and then go to school board meeting. And then again, we've seen it. If school board members are not following or agreeing to what parents demand, you vote them out. I mean, I know some of them are in there for more than two or three years, but that's probably your only avenue. And from that point, then it's time to start emailing uh, your legislatures. Find out who your state representative is. Make your concerns known. You're, you're a voter, for God's sakes. They don't want to you know, get people angry about this. However, they'll also not backtrack, but they'll give you the political response. Oh, yes, we know about this, but uh, yeah, we think this is the best course of action. Uh, we agree with this, that, and the other thing. And a lot of politicians nowadays have good intentions, but they're really not following procedure. And I, I, I want to say one thing. The problem with this industry, Jay, is there really is no licensing or certification or some kind of standard, whether it's federal or state. I really don't want the federal government involved, it should be up to the states, but there's really no certification for this process. So you've got vendors, you've got people with no background in this at all that are talking about this stuff and they get backed by vendors who want to sell you something. They want to sell you metal detectors, gun detection, certain cameras and this, and you get blanketed. And I've been out of the, out of it now for what here we're 2024. It was at six years. When I worked for the county, I was getting emails constantly from these vendors. Hey, can we meet and talk about this app that I've got? I've got an app on your phone. You push a button and everything's locked and it calls the police and it does this and it does that. No, it it was all, it was all junk. It it, it was, it was nothing. It it just didn't work. And I don't care nowadays people, oh, AI is going to help us and technology is going to help us. Look, the one thing that is usually brought up is metal detectors. Because parents will scream, look, we've had all these incidents. We have to do something. So principals, administrators go, hey, I got a grant from such and such. We'll put in metal detectors. Phew. All right, we're done. We're good. No, metal detectors are what we call security theater. They look good. They don't do anything. If I'm an individual who's crazy enough to go in and want to shoot somebody up, do you think a metal detector is going to stop me? Heck no. And the other thing about getting weapons in schools. These kids are not dumb. Look, 
all these kids know where the cameras are and where the hiding places are. They know how to get into that school through a certain gate, through a certain door. And every one of these shooters is either a former student or a current student. And don't you think they're watching that school? I tell you, Jay, today I can go to any high school in my area. I'm going to find an open door. I'm going to find a door that's wedged open. Why? Because the kid's late. The teacher's out for a smoke. They're getting a pizza delivery. God knows what. There'll be a door wedged open. And don't you think somebody is watching that and knowing they can get in that way? It's, 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 it's something that's all encompassing. And I know we talk about emergency drills themselves, but just the common sense stuff of how the school is secure in the outer perimeter and in the inner perimeter. And if you've got doors that are wedged open, if you've got gates that don't lock, if you've got people that aren't watching, you're going to be in trouble. You know, somebody is going to get angry and they're going to go in and I'm sorry, shoot that school up. So it's something where I tell parents, look, you've got a PTA, you've got uh, what they call SAC meetings, a student uh, council. You've got areas where you do get together with students who care about their school and parents. And I tell these kids years ago, and again, I'm sorry I go back to years ago when I was a kid. We used to have, you know, uh, uh, not campus security, but there's just kids that were involved in, you know, the doors open or the cleanliness of the school. Or, you know, back then it was smoking was so bad. You couldn't smoke this and that. But nowadays, kids should take ownership of their school. If you got school pride, you know what? Walk around that school every couple of hours. You're not ratting on anybody. You're not snitching on anybody. You're looking for open doors. Just walk around that school. So it it, it takes a few minutes. And you don't, it, okay, because it used to be years ago, got uh, kids that wanted to get into police work or fire or military. You know, they were the ones that were a little more involved and wanted to do that. Fine. Help the SROs out or help the, the campus security out. Walk around the school. Look for those open doors. They're open. Close them. The biggest, my biggest pet peeve, that stupid triangle wedge, that wood block you'd use to block the door open or a rock they get to block the door open. And it happens all the time. So kid, take ownership of the school. I mean, just make that suggestion of, of doing something like that. And as a parent, I would also push that. I'd say, hey, number one thing is, as we know, uh, school resource officers, armed school resource officers. I mean, it's, it's a no brainer. Now, I know during the pandemic and all this defund the police movement, oh, no, I don't want to see a badge. Oh, the uniform, I want to seek my safe space. Tough. Those people, those officers are there to protect you. They're not there to arrest you. They're not there to harass you. They are an advocate. They are there for the administration, teachers, parents, and you as a student. That's what they're there for. That's what they're trained for, to take care of any. They're going to go. One person, I was taught in the Secret Service, you go. You don't wait for anybody if there's an active shooter. You go. Now, devil's advocate, oh, well, what happened in Parkland? What happened in Uvalde? Look, that's 0.001% that's out there. That's going to happen. The media is going to concentrate on that. But 99.9% of all SROs and police officers, they're trained to go. They're going to go. Got it. Got it. Wow. This is, um, this is crazy. This is a, it is a, it is a crazy weird world that we live in. Uh, I think the, it, I think the most important thing that I can say as, as the host of feel good father that, you know, it, it certainly wasn't, I'm not here and we're not here to have this conversation as an alarmist thing or to do all this kind of jazz. But what I'm loving is this piece is that the core, the central tenant, of, of Daniel's message is be informed, be involved, mm -hmm. know what's happening with your kids, know how to empower, empower them, know the kind of conversations to have. Um, and that, that all is very integrated and aligned with the feel good fatherhood way. Um, even if the topic is super uncomfortable, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> and I, and I've had these kind of discussions with my, with my, uh, with my two kids, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter about the drill she was having and understanding what she was going through. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were, and where we were, it was definitely uh, on lockdown. Like it was, that was the core element that the entire school Good. was completely locked down. It was, Good. that was the way it went. That was the discussion I had. And I remember going through it. Um, and I think you're correct. You know, we were concerned, you know, mom and myself were concerned about how our, 
oldest was handling this discussion and she was fine, right? It's, it's unnerving, no more unnerving than watching uh, a suspenseful or scary movie, no more unnerving than that. Yes. Uh, and so it does make them tougher. It does prepare them for the world they live in. Yes. Um, it's unfortunate that this is the case, but that's the truth. That's the truth yes. of, of what's going on. Daniel, is there anything else that we want to tell Feel Good Fathers before, uh, before we wrap? Uh, what I say at the end of every podcast is, number one, and this is across the board, is you keep yourself safe first. Uh, whenever you're in an incident, some emergency incident, you keep yourself safe first, then you can save lives. I try to give the metaphor when you're on a plane and that oxygen mask drop down, what do they tell you? You put the oxygen mask on first, then you can help the child or the elderly with it. So in any kind of emergency situation, keep yourself safe first, then you're going to be able to help others. And the second thing, obviously, which I already mentioned is armed SROs on campus. Uh, down here in Florida, we're lucky. Uh, it goes by the number of students we have in school. So if it's uh, under a thousand, it's one. If it gets up to a thousand, we get two uh, SROs. But yeah, uh, advocate for that. Also, if your school does not have them, use the money that way, not for technology, not for metal detectors or cameras. Get the uh, SROs on your campus. SROs and door locks, right? Exactly. Yes. Lock the door during class time. You're a one step ahead of it already. Yeah. Got it. Daniel uh, Deleuzneski, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jay.